I'm Joel Ashton and recently I took a trip to the Isle of Wight where I had the pleasure of interviewing a man who's a very familiar face on our television screens. He's also a man over the last few decades who has designed and created many beautiful gardens and equally he's inspired many more thousands of people to do the same. That man of course is Alan Titchmarsh and I'm very pleased to give you this interview today where we spoke about his life and his achievements but also now a more important message which is you know how we can all help wildlife in these current times and how we need to now do our own bit to help and preserve what wildlife we have left. So let's have a look at what he had to say. So Alan, what was your first real experience with nature as a child? What do you remember as your first kind of, you know, kind of real moment that sort of made you intrigued about the natural world? Well, I was born uh, four years after the war ended. Um, so the Second World War, okay, yeah, not the first. <laughs> <laughs> and you know there was still a lot of blackout material left. That they used to, it was it black, literally black, cotton cloths yeah. that they used to put up the windows to give that. I remember lying on our back lawn in Ilkley in Yorkshire, tiny little terrace house with a, um, a back yard which is about that big, and then the back which is a little lane, and then a garden uh, with a mid in. To one, to one end of it, which is a sort of stone shed that my mother said, never go in there. And I never did find out what was in there, I never did go in there. This blackout material, I used to lie on the lawn in the back garden with the blackout material over me, having scattered bird food on the lawn, <laughs> and watch just blackbirds, chaffinches, mm. thrushes, sparrows come down. And, and I remember in summer getting incredibly hot under oh, yeah. this blackout material. But when I was eight, I joined the Wharfdale Naturalist Society. Um, I don't have to explain to you the difference between the Naturist Society and the Naturalist Society. Slight difference. There aren't we many won't go down that route. Well, there aren't there. many Naturist Societies <laughs> in Yorkshire, it's still blooming cold. Um, so I've been a member of the Wharfdale Nats since I was eight, oh, and I still am. I just loved wild, it was just the most natural thing. I always liked being out. Um, and the garden was the nearest bit of nature. Mm. And it was, you know, if you look, things come, you know, oh, yeah. bees butterflies, obviously birds, and I've always been one of those people who likes to look after the pennies, then the pounds to take care of themselves. The little bit of ground that I am in charge of, you don't necessarily need to own it, but that you are the custodian of. Absolutely. If you make that better, you're doing your bit. And I know on television now I talk to millions, which is very important, but it's to spread that individual message that everybody can make a difference. And it worries me a bit that in, in the, all these huge conversations about climate change and global warming, the danger of it is that we give people the impression that they as individuals can't do anything about it. Of course, yeah. And I regard my job as saying to you, you can, you know. Yeah, yeah. And if yeah. we all have our little patch on this enormous quilt that's the British Isles. It adds we, up, doesn't it? It creates well, a mosaic. That, yeah. Entirely. And I think that's really important. And a corridor for wildlife to move. Yeah. Know, well. And if they're not there, mm. it doesn't matter. You know, you are affecting the bigger yeah, picture. Yeah. Yeah. And I think. If I, in my small way, can encourage people to garden in a wildlife friendly way, because a garden to me is a home for wildlife and you can't be selected. You can't no, be no, said, I don't want so you get a badger digging up your lawn, you get a mole doing the same kind of thing, and you get deer coming in it, whatever. <laughs> All those things. Some of it you just have to accept, don't you? Yeah, you share it mm. and it's important that you do and when you do share and it's working, that for me is the greatest joy. Brilliant. So Alan, you're a bit like us in the fact that you left school as soon as, as soon as you could to uh, <laughs> pursue a career in horticulture. What was the kind of influences there? I knew what I loved. I wasn't particularly happy at school. I was 11 plus failure. I like to think I was a late developer. I'm still waiting. <laughs> I'm hoping I will develop. This time, yeah. I knew what I loved and I knew I loved being outside and I loved working with nature. That's what drove me into gardening because gardening was the nearest bit of nature. The patch of earth outside yeah. our back door and working with whatever was on that was my delight. And so I badgered my parents into letting me leave school at 15 before I took my O-levels, as they were called then, GC yeah. GCEs, or whatever, you, whatever they are now. Um, and I left at 15 with one O-level in art, which I took a year early, that's my only. I then did, a few years later, take English just to show that I could do it. Um, so I do have actually two O-levels now, but I only have one then. And I got a job as an apprentice on the local Parks Department nursery under glass in the nursery and I was given three Victorian greenhouses to look after. Wow. I died and gone to free rain. 
Yeah, because at home I'd have a little three foot by six foot plastic on that, mm. polythene that I'd made. And I used to sow seeds every year. My dad, who was a plumber, didn't confess to me until much later on that his father and grandfather had both been gardeners, so it was clearly in the sap. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I honestly say, um, I've never regretted doing that. It's led, not just because it's led me into the most varied life that I never expected. Somebody said to me once, he said, Dumb, when you became an apprentice in the parks department in Oakley, did you realise that was the way to get your own chat show? And I said, oh yeah, it was a very careful career structure. <laughs> no, I always do what, uh, shall I have a go, you know, old you nose and jump mm -hmm. kind of thing, really. Yeah. But uh, I've never regretted, I couldn't bear to be divorced from nature, from wildlife, no. from gardening. And the two for me are completely interwoven. Mm -hmm. and, and I think people think gardening is for people who can't do anything else who were too thick to do anything else and it's kind of messing around mm. it's not it's the sharp end of conservation of course, if yeah. you want it to be mm. and i do i regard it as well it's, it's the foundation important. of that background knowledge isn't it of all yeah. the wildflowers all the plants that the bees and the butterflies and everything else rely on uh, and once you get that framework in your head you can then you know, pursue that and try and conserve some of these species that are struggling actively mm. and i think that's the thing about gardeners we are the only interactive truly interactive naturalists um, bird watchers watch. Most naturalists observe and don't, they would say, interfere. They let wildlife get on with it. But gardeners, we have an opportunity at the sharp end of conservation to improve matters for wildlife, to put things in that are pollinators, you yeah. know, um, that, that will encourage bees, butterflies, um, and up the wildlife ante, you know, just make, we can make a difference. And that has always attracted me about gardening. Seems so simple. Just wish more careers offices in schools. Yeah, absolutely. Careers advice. That was my concept. problem. Is that there wasn't the advice. You know, it was either because we were, you know, fortunate enough to go to a grammar school. I say fortunate enough. We could question that, but um, you know, we didn't have that. You know, it was kind of university or nothing. There were no kind of MVQs, and it was. You know, I really think there should be yeah. a bit of reform in that sense. We're working hard at getting apprenticeships going again now. I'm, I'm doing bits of work to, to encourage that because I was one. The, my pyramid was built the right way up. And I think it's important that your breadth of learning at the beginning and then you specialise. So many people come in and say, I want to be a garden designer yeah, or I yeah. want to be a landscape architect without knowing the vocabulary, the plant Absolutely. vocabulary, mm -hmm. in order to funnel them into design. Yeah. You need to know, if you're an artist, you need to know how paint works mm -hmm. before you can paint a masterpiece. Yeah. It's the same in horticulture. I w was very lucky, but the problem that even at secondary school was that gardening, rural studies as it was called back in the day, was only for B, C and D streams. Mm. I did happen to be in the A stream, so we did it for a term and that was it. I knew it was what I wanted to do. Mm. So I said, all right, blow this, I'll, leave yeah. and I'll even do it full time. Yeah. I can remember the feeling on that first day when I was taken into these Victorian greenhouses and told they were mine of, of, of disbelief. And he shut the door and said, get on, do your watering. And I nearly wept. It was, well, it was yeah. so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, to be a part of a growth, literally a growth industry, mm. and I've never ever regretted that. Funny actually, I met a, a musician a while ago, a famous musician, I won't say who it was, and he said to me, he said, oh, and you know, he said, you and I are so lucky, aren't we? He said, we've never had to do a day's work in our lives, <laughs> and I feel like that really. Brilliant. Yeah. So Alan, being a fellow garden designer, what would you say are the biggest challenges when somebody says to you, well, obviously you probably don't do so much garden design now but back in the days of ground force etc when you used to turn up with your sketch pad and try and think about what would work in a garden what would you say are the main constraints or the main problems that anybody might face well i'm still doing it most spring and summer on love your garden on itv of course, yeah, so yeah, we're still yeah. designing gardens for that it's getting the balance right the difficulty with garden design on television is i always compare it to painting a picture when you paint a picture you paint a picture then you find a frame for it. When you're designing a garden, you have to build the frame and then you put the picture into it. So there's a great you know, problem with people watching you make a garden and they see all this hard landscaping going down, think, when are the plants coming in? Because mm. you're making the frame first. Yeah. And the biggest, um, most important thing in garden design is getting the balance right. Mm. It's, it's all about the plants for me, yeah. the frame, the decking, uh, the paving, the gravel, the rock, stone, hard landscape, whatever, holds the rest of the garden together, but it's the plant material which is the most important. And getting people used to, in the way of planting things which are more wildlife friendly, 
single flowers for bees and butterflies. It's been very interesting recently, last week I was explaining the difference between single flowers and double flowers to someone who's quite bright. And I said, well, single flowers, you know, think of a daisy or, you know, any flower which has got the sexual parts in the middle, the stigma and the stamens and the petals, the attractive bit around the edge to draw the insect in to pollinate the central flower. When you breed a flower or a plant to have double flowers, all those sexual organs in the middle are replaced by more petals. Mm. Um, or certainly they're made smaller and the petals crowd around it, harder to pollinate, not attractive to insects. He said, Oh, is that the problem? I said, yes, they just want to get the nectar and the pollen. And if you're breeding all these double flowers and your garden's full of them, there's, there's no food right. for them. So getting people used to planting single flowers for pollinators, uh, Nipita catmint, uh, lavender, phacelia, um, um, echiums on, in this part of the world, mm, yeah. you know, or vipers bugloss, which is a hardier echium. You can spot the plants that the bees home in on. And, it's still a lot of problem in getting people used to the fact that bees are a vital in the garden and they're not going to come up and go, yeah. Yeah, unless you're doing a windmill impersonation or, <laughs> the, the, you know, bee stings are rare. I know some people, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, anaphylactic shock is not an easy, not a, yeah, a pleasant thing. <laughs> but that said, the vast majority of us, let them go around, you know, we yeah, yeah. need them. Yeah. And getting that across to folk that, I uh, did a lovely story, um, a lady said to me, I've only got a doorstep, what can I do? This is, uh, I get email queries the whole time. Try and answer them, can't always answer them. Well, no, actually, to be honest, I nearly do all of them. Um, and anyway, this lead lady you know, she said, I've only got a doorstep, what can I do? So I said, get up, you know, these are good pollinating plants. Plant them. You love it when you come in and look at them. She, she, I got an email back about two months later. She said, a bee came to my pot, <laughs> a bee. And yeah. I thought, how so, lovely yeah. that yeah. someone was so it's thrilled that they yeah. got a bee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, one of my favourites is the Verbena bonariensis because yes. it's just the flowering period. And I mean, we've counted something around about 17 species of butterfly that actually yeah. nectar on it. And although it's not a non-native, um, sorry, th although it is a non-native, it's you know it is phenomenal because I think of the you flowering get, period. I think well. you get hung up on that. You see, oh, it's got to be a oh, native. Yeah. No, yeah. they'll they'll come. Wildlife as a whole, they're opportunists. Mm. If you give them an inch, they'll take a yard, thank Absolutely. God, and they'll come in. Mm. Verbena bonariensis is wonderful, as you said, bees and butterflies. Also because it's a sort of opaque plant, you can see through it. You can go front or back a border, can't it? Yeah. It doesn't really matter. And it know. seeds itself yeah. about, yeah. and you can shot the old ones down oh, in yes. winter. And, oh, they'll come. Pretty hardy, Good plant. like a budley. <laughs> Secret is to watch. I think that's the thing. Look at what happens in your garden and plant those things that you can see the bees and the butterflies enjoy. And, you know, they are flying flowers, aren't they, butterflies? You just get a price again. Jewels of the sky. That's it. Well, what an experience that was. I hope you enjoyed the interview. And please feel free to give the video a like and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed it. And I'll be sure to bring you more videos on the wildlife around the UK, how you can help wildlife in your own back garden and many other topics to come. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.